I don't know if you knew it or not, but I don't have any siblings. The big group that dropped me off at camp every year was a van full of cousins. So many cousins, we could have formed a band. My understanding of siblings is that when they give you shit, your parents eventually intervene. That's not what happens with cousins. They have free reign to make fun of you and neither your parents or their parents will ever step in because they're too busy dealing with their own sibling stuff to deal with y'all. My cousins came up with a nickname for me by the time I was 15 and used it relentlessly. Veronica V-Card. V-Card? Like... Virginity. Veronica the Virgin. Veronica that never had a boyfriend or a kiss or a date to homecoming. Veronica who couldn't seem to get a dude to look at her even when she was wearing her mom's brightest red lipstick. I was an old spinster at 15, which is mind-boggling now that I have my own daughter who's rapidly approaching that age. She's still playing with dolls with her friends, and nobody seems to be saying a word. As much as everyone bitches about kids' TikTok and social media scrolling, I'm finding myself grateful for it because it seems to have slowed the rate at which teenagers become bored enough to start touching each other before they had the capacity to think about the consequences. When we were that age, it's the only thing any of us talked about. Having sex or not having it, either way, somehow it became a defining tenant of your personality. Getting labeled Veronica V-Card had an impact. You probably remember. I was desperate for boys to notice me. It didn't matter that I was well on my way to becoming valedictorian or that I had a wide array of interests and ambitions. I was defective because at the age of 15, I'd already been given a label that made me feel small and ashamed. Labels are tough, whether you're trying to live up to them or prove them wrong. I know a lot about that. This is the crime at Camp Ashwood. Episode 5, Veronica V. Card. There. You look like if Lindsay Lohan went to the Oscars with an Audrey Hepburn updo. Classic. Mm, It's not too red. The box said light auburn, but this feels... fire engine-y. No, it's bold. I feel like this is the you inside you that has been waiting to come out. You really like it? Love it. With a capital L. Veronica, be honest. It's too red, right? It's... Very, very red. But Sadie's right. Something about it really works. <sighs> okay. I'm putting my faith in you two. Good. We can officially call tonight's trial hair and makeup run for the dance complete then. Wow, ladies. Did I miss an invitation? Everyone looks amazing. We're just prepping our dance ensembles. I heard about the Moulin Rouge theme. That's one of my favorite movies. Yeah, so romantic. And, speaking of romance, tonight's Midnight Mystery Hour is coming in, piping hot. <laughs> Ooh, la la. Do tell, Miss June. The year was 1993. The soundtrack was Janet. Ooh, that is sexy. Very. Claire couldn't stand to be away from her boyfriend, Logan, and had snuck him back to her cabin on initiation night. A woman after my own heart. Indeed. But Claire wasn't just meeting up for covert kisses on the lake. She wanted to go all the way. In the cabins? Brave. (laughs) Dumb. Guys, shut up! You keep interrupting! Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to get in the way of your sex education, (laughs) V. It's not like you're some expert, Sadie. Claire had saved up and packed at least 20 scented candles in her camp trunk for this plan. She set them up around the room, one by one, lighting them and letting their chaotic combination of vanilla musk, ocean mist, rainwater, and freesia take over the space. When Logan showed up, he upped the ante even more with a bottle of vodka he'd swiped from his counselor's bag. These people wanted to get kicked out of camp. True. Many rules were broken, but their plan worked, for a time. Within minutes of Logan showing up, drinks were downed and clothes were discarded. They kissed, only lit by Claire's candles, and the passion between them was so strong that they didn't even notice. 
The camp staff believed that one of Claire's candles must have fallen over, knocked aside in the heat of the moment. But both Claire and Logan swore that they weren't close enough to have tipped one. It must have been some outside force, they said. Oh my god, this was the fire at Cabin 19? 1993, right? It was. Wait, this is real? What happened to them? Well, they were kicked out of camp and asked never to return. Logan even served some time in juvie for stealing the alcohol and giving it to Claire. They never saw each other again. That's heartbreaking. But it's a good reminder of fire safety rules, with or without ghostly tampering. You can never be too careful. I'll see you girls in the morning. June, wait! Yeah? So, did they, uh, do it? Go all the way? Before the fire started? Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe? Night, girls. Losing your virginity in the cabins would be... Kind of legendary. Don't get any ideas. We've had enough drama for one summer. Besides, think about it. Everyone is still talking about poor Claire and her sexcapades a decade later. Talk about giving yourself a reputation. Yeah, a legendary reputation. <laughs> that story was kind of hot. You should find someone to sneak back here, Veronica. Since I'm out of get-out-of-jail-free cards with Ashwood, apparently. Plus, that would definitely get your little nickname off your back. What nickname? CD, no! Oh... It's just something the girls at our high school say. They're losers anyway. Right, V? Right. I guess I never knew how deep the whole single thing cut for you. It was definitely worse at school than at Ashwood. I never would have even cared if not for that stupid nickname. So I guess when Paul came along, you were pretty anxious to get together. I mean, that does make- No. I need you to let me finish. Yes, I wanted a boyfriend, but with Paul, it was a lot more than that. He understood me. We understood each other. I'd lived with this label on me and the effects of it, and he'd been through the same thing. Growing up the son of the sheriff in town isn't easy for a lot of reasons, but the biggest for Paul was that his dad had somehow taken all his experiences as a cop, all the troublemakers he'd arrested and the hurt he'd seen people cause, and he decided his own son was just like those people. From when Paul was a little boy, every time someone in his group of friends broke a toy or a rule, his dad would immediately blame him. He'd say that Paul must have convinced the friend to behave badly or said he was lying about what really happened. It was like Sheriff Westerly had been trained to assume the worst about people at work, and he'd brought that bias home. When Paul was in high school, he started living up to his dad's expectations. The sneaking out and petty theft, getting girls like Sadie into mischief... He figured if he was going to get blamed for things no matter what, he might as well have a little fun in between. But he never hurt anyone. Not on purpose. He loved his friends. The little things he'd steal from convenience stores, beer, or temporary tattoos, or whatever, were all just to give the people he cared about something fun to do. He had good intentions. And he'd been crazy about Sadie since he'd first laid eyes on her. He knew he wasn't unique in that respect. A lot of guys wanted to go out with her, but he felt protective over her. Did you know that he waited months to even try to kiss her? I didn't know that. Well, he did. He even said he felt like he should wait because Sadie wasn't ready. She was somewhere else mentally. She had a lot going on. Sadie? She told Paul things she never told you and me. Things about her life at home. Her parents fighting or the pressure her dad put on her to get good grades. The pressure she felt about a lot of things. Honestly, Margo, Paul and Sadie were only kids when they dated. The way he describes it, they were really close friends more than anything else. It's not like they ever even had sex. It was romantic, but Paul always thought he liked her more than she ever liked him. Her parents were fighting? Yeah. I didn't know that. Unfortunately. Can I come up? Yes, please. I don't know what's up with me. I'm wired. Maybe I should have skipped that extra soda after dinner. Maybe it's the new hair injecting its fieriness into your brain. <laughs> <laughs> Shh. 
We'll wake Veronica. Nah, she's the world's heaviest sleeper. Why are you up? Probably listening to you squirm. <laughs> no, really. You've been up late a lot lately. I don't know. Just a lot on my mind, I guess. Did you and Paul have a fight? We never fight. <laughs> it's true. Believe what you want. What about you and JJ? I don't think I know him well enough to fight with him yet. But you like him? I do like him, actually. You were right. I knew it. <laughs> I could be a professional matchmaker. He's got that broody, sensitive thing that you love going on. He does. <laughs> you never answered me. About what's keeping you up? Just thinking about the future, I guess. College and jobs and weddings. It feels like it's all going to come really fast, doesn't it? I've never heard you worry about how fast anything was coming. Plus, I don't know about you, but I'm not getting married until I'm at least 30. <laughs> you say that now, but you don't really know. You're not planning some teenage elopement with Paul, are you? No. No. I just... I don't know. Sometimes I think I'd like to start my own family sooner than later. A place where I could really be in charge of everything. Sadie, you're already in charge of most things. <laughs> Maybe so. Hey, wanna just sleep up here tonight? Maybe if one of us can fall asleep, we'll help the other along. Okay. But if you steal all the covers, I'm going back to my bed. Deal. You knew Sadie really well. But nobody can know everything about someone. I see this every day at the police department. Spouses come in, shocked to find out their husband or wife has been doing something illegal. All of a sudden, they feel like they never really knew the person at all. But that's not true. They knew the version of them they were when they were with them. People hide things from each other. Sometimes because it's embarrassing or because they know it's wrong. But sometimes it's because they're just living up to our expectation of them. Sadie lived up to being cool and bubbly for you in the same way that Paul lived up to being a troublemaker because his dad expected it. And that doesn't make you question Paul? Not even for a second? Why do you think the case was so badly botched? Because the sheriff's son did it. See, what I believe is that Paul's dad believed Paul did it. So... He came up with a narrative that he knew other people would buy and swept as much as he could under the rug. It's what Paul believes, too. That his dad thinks so little of him that he'd stop a case from really getting solved, thinking he was protecting his son. And what Sheriff Westerly doesn't realize is that what he did ended up freezing everyone in a place where we could never move on. You're not the only person in Asheville who thinks Paul is responsible. He can barely do a grocery run without someone side-eyeing him. It's the whole reason I took the job at the station when an opening came up for a secretary. To see if I could overhear something to report back to Paul. We've been tracking your own version of the investigation the whole time. It's been slow going as hell, but sometimes a tip about another case comes in and we see if the culprit has any similarities to what we know of Sadie's case. People killed in bodies of water, for example. Teenagers who were attacked. Someone who'd be predatory to young girls. Nothing has panned out. But we keep trying. A lot of the stuff has been sealed in the office, and when Sadie's parents passed away, we were finally able to go through it. I nudged the detectives that we might be able to clear up some room in the office. It's how I got access to the journal. And I'd hoped that you'd take a look at it something would jog your memory after all these years. That you'd call me, if it did. Because barging into the police office isn't going to do shit. If anything, it'll tip people off that some of us are still searching for what happened to Sadie, and believe me, that department will squash any mention of it like a bug. They picked the story they were going with a long time ago. Any other version hurts them as far as they see it. Would you show me what you guys have found so far? Yeah. On one condition. Okay. 
You've got to rope Paul innocent in your own mind. He didn't do this. I mean, I hear what you're saying, and the story is plausible, but I'm not Paul's wife. I don't have to believe him. Then maybe you believe his alibi. He didn't have one. The department didn't want to get into it because they didn't want to get into anything. He has one. And it's someone I can talk to. I don't know how you're going to feel about it. But yeah. <sighs> Who is it? When was the last time you spoke to JJ? Thank you for listening to this episode of The Crime at Camp Ashwood. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss a single episode. If you'd like to support this podcast so we can keep making more episodes, click the support link in the show notes. To learn more about this and all our projects, visit our production company websites, dragonhunterproductions.com and newgirlpictures.com. Thank you for listening.